a very important subject, highly doctrinal, and one that we've got to understand if we are to really know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I'm speaking of Christ the great creator this afternoon. When I was a boy, I remembered hearing a sermon, I guess similar to the one that I'm about to preach. And in that sermon, I heard something that I don't think I'd ever comprehended before. Just a little boy, but I was listening. And during the sermon, the preacher said something about Jesus being eternal. And that Jesus Christ came to this earth to live among men. Now those of us who have studied our Bibles for a while and are New Testament Christians, we understand that indeed Jesus Christ did come to earth. But I had not comprehended that at the time. And so later I asked my dad, I said, do you mean Jesus didn't have his beginning when he was born in Bethlehem? And he said, no, son. Jesus has always been. He is part of the divine Godhead. I'm not sure to this day I still, as a human being with a finite mind, can fully grasp the Godhead. But by faith, I know that there is such one God composed of three distinct beings. We know as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The reason that's difficult to comprehend is because you cannot compare the divine Godhead to anything else. There is nothing else like the divine Godhead. But I know this, Jesus Christ is eternal and He is part of that Godhead. Now, having said that, let's open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1 and let's do a little study for just a few minutes. Colossians chapter 1 I want you to notice in verse 15 of this chapter that Paul the writer says concerning Christ that he is the Some would take this passage and take this passage alone and say, you see, Jesus was a created being because the text here says he is the firstborn of every creature. There was Jesus who was created and then everything else was created. But you know, if you just look at the context of something, you'll usually be able to defeat a false idea. In this particular passage, what is the theme it is the supremacy of Christ. That's what the book of Colossians is all about. In your study, have you ever noticed similarities between Colossians of the Christ of the church? So Colossians is all about the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16 of Colossians 1. For by Him, that's Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Watch this. All things Jesus being the great creator. Not only does it say, say that Jesus is the great creator, you continue reading in verse 17, He is the one that holds everything together. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Not only that, we see His supremacy in verse 18. For He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. There's that word firstborn, by the way. But this time in relationship to his death and his resurrection. Firstborn from the dead. 
But in verse 20 we find that through Him peace has been made through the blood of His cross and through Him reconciliation with God takes place. So once again we see His supremacy. He is in all things, verse 18 again, preeminent. He is the preeminent one. And verse 19, in Him all fullness dwells. Fullness dwells in Him. What does that mean? All of the characteristics of the divine Godhead can be found in Jesus. But our religious friends like Jehovah's Witnesses and others will contend that Jesus Christ is not an eternal being, but rather He is the first being that ever was created. Now I recognize that there are two different ways to consider this word firstborn. One has to do with time. If I said to you, Cason Grider is my firstborn child, you'd understand that he was the first one born to Cilicia and me. All of you in this room who are parents, you have a firstborn. And usually that's how we interpret that word firstborn. It means the first one born in a family. Listen to Luke 2 verse 7 concerning Mary. She gave birth to her firstborn son. That's Jesus, isn't it? She wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger. But in Matthew 13, 55, we learn that Mary also had other children, didn't she? Among them, James, who wrote the book of James, Jude, who wrote the book of Jude. But her firstborn son in the flesh was whom? Jesus. So it is right to speak of Jesus as a firstborn to Mary, as that relates to time. But is that how that particular word is used in Colossians 1, 15? You see, there's another meaning of firstborn that is not connected to time, but rather it is connected to one's preeminence. of our Lord Jesus. I want us to look at a few other pages in the Bible and see how that at times this word firstborn did not relate to time. Look if you would in Exodus the fourth chapter and you recall that Moses is standing uh, before a, a burning bush and uh, he is having a discussion with the one that I believe is under consideration right now, the second person of the Godhead. But Moses is, uh, has been commanded to go to Pharaoh. And in verse 22, when he asks, What shall I say to Pharaoh? The Lord says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, does that mean that Israel was the first nation that was ever created in our world? No. But it does mean that Israel was God's chosen people at the time. Therefore, this particular uh, statement, Israel is my firstborn, has to do with Israel's preeminence, doesn't it? Among all the nations of the earth. In Jeremiah 31, 9, Ephraim, that tribe, is called God's firstborn. Now, who was Ephraim? Ephraim was one of the sons of Joseph. The other son was Manasseh. Who was the firstborn to Joseph? It was Manasseh, wasn't it? So is there some contradiction here? In Genesis 41, 51, Manasseh is the first one born to Joseph. And yet in Jeremiah 31, 9, Ephraim is the firstborn. No, it's used differently with Ephraim in Jeremiah 31, 9, for in that passage it means Ephraim was more prominent than was Manasseh. So we see that it carries a different meaning. First in rank, first in preeminence. Then consider this passage in Psalm 89, 27. It is a passage that speaks of David, and God says, I also shall make him, David, my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now consider this just for a moment. 
David was not the firstborn to Jesse, was he? Rather, he was uh, the eighth son born to Jesse. When David fought Goliath, remember that David just happened upon the scene, checking on his brothers. They were older than him. They were in Saul's army. They were ready to fight. Or they were part of that crowd that was afraid to fight. They were supposed to be ready to fight. And it was David, the younger brother, his older brother, Eliab, was embarrassed by the fact that David had arrived on the scene. And, of course, we know that wonderful account um, from the Old Testament, how that David defeated uh, Goliath. But David was considered God's firstborn because of the position that he held. Now, it's this latter, latter definition for firstborn that I would argue is what is under consideration in Galatians chapter 1. So we go back to that text again and notice again what it says in verse 15 of Colossians 1 about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. What's the context? The supremacy of Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the preeminent one. Jesus is God. Verse 15 says He is the Im image of the invisible God. He's Hebrews 1.3, He's the express image of the person of God. Therefore, all of the characteristics that relate to God the Father are also found in God the Son. And Psalm 90 and verse 1 teaches us that our God is an eternal being. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And so if the Father is eternal, so is the Son eternal. And so as we consider Jesus Christ and His eternal nature, we're reminded of the opening of the book of John. John chapter 1. Remember in John chapter 1, we read, in the beginning was the Word. Now that is the way that the writer describes the second person of the Godhead in that context. In the beginning was the Word, the second person of the Godhead. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now listen, all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Speaking of that same one identified as the Word, verse 14 relates to us, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what has happened? The Word, the one who was in the beginning with God, the one who likewise was and is God, came to this earth and put on the form of flesh, and lived among us. Now, having proven that Jesus Christ is the second person of the, of the divine Godhead, and that He's eternal in nature, we go back and look at something else again in Col Colossians 1 to nail the door shut. In verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God. When you see Jesus, you see God. The firstborn of every creature, but remember, we have determined that it has to be uh, understood as the preeminent one, because in verse 16, notice what the text says about Jesus. For by Him were all things that are created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Now, there is a problem with this idea that Jesus was a created being as taught by our Jehovah's Witness friends. And that is that the text says Jesus Christ created everything. Therefore, if He is a created being, what did He have to do? Create Himself. And that is an utter impossibility, right? You see, in order for Him to have created all things, He must have always existed. And that's exactly what the Scriptures teach about this one we know as Jesus the Christ. He created everything. But we know this, if He was a created being, He could not have created everything, for He could not have created Himself.
And so when speaking of Jesus, we acknowledge Him as the great Creator. When you read uh, such passages, Psalm 33, 9, the text which says, He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now I better understand who it was that spoke. It was the divine spokesperson, which always appears to be the second person, Jesus Christ. God hath spoken in these last days, for example, according to Hebrews 1, 1 and following, He hath spoken in these last days through His Son, Jesus the Christ. But if you understand His role in the Godhead, He always seems to be the one speaking. He is the one who spoke the worlds into existence. He would be the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush or through that burning bush. He was the one who came to this earth and spoke the words that were from on high. He is the eternally existing one. He lived before Bethlehem. He has always been. And of course, the best news of all, our great Creator became our Savior. And we rejoice in Jesus because not only is He our Creator, He likewise is our Savior. He's your Savior this afternoon. That is, all that is necessary for any one of us to be saved has been accomplished through Him. He doesn't force His will upon any of us, but if anyone wants to be saved through Him, He can be. If He indeed is the great Creator and the great Savior, He sets the terms whereby we can be saved, whereby reconciliation with the divine Godhead can take place. And that comes through a penitent faith that leads a man to confess Jesus and to be baptized in water for the remission of sins. Why not this afternoon, if need be, allow your great Creator to become your great Savior? We offer heaven's invitation even now as together we stand and sing.